And I know that there are singles among us, and I know that there's uh, teenagers that have the, the dream of getting married someday, probably. And, uh, and uh, the, the message is not just for those that are couples, but it's for those that, that desire that, uh, to be, uh, to have a godly marriage. And uh, so we focused on the, the marriage union. And in that, we talked about that successful families uh, don't just happen on accident. on there we go well, one of the verses I, I noticed this week is uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 28 I want you to flip there with me real quick uh, Paul is talking to the Corinthians church and he's saying hey if you're burning with passion he says it's better to get married than to stay single and and uh, and uh, burn with uh, passion for the opposite sex but he warns us and what I thought was interesting in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 verse number 28, in the middle portion, he says, but those who marry, all right, which will probably be the majority of us at some point uh, in our lives, but those who marry will face many troubles in this life. And it's like, oh, great. Well, the reality is, is that anytime you put two people, two sinners together, there's going to be conflict, there's going to be struggle, and so rest assured that if you're married and, uh, or if you're in a, uh, a family and you uh, have parents that are married uh, and there's struggle, there's conflict, it's, it's somewhat normal, okay? And uh, the fact is, is that, that God, He gets the glory for that. But I'll tell you this, marriages are worth fighting for. How many would agree with that? And we talk about God being number one in our life, right? God first, our family second. But I want you to see something, and when we talk about families, that in, within that family, in that second portion, that our marriages come first. Before the kids, before our career, before our, our ministry, God first, family second. But within that family, marriages come first. And today, we're going to kind of shift the focus just slightly and look at the role of a man. And uh, I'm kind of haunted by a saying that you're very familiar with, the idea that uh, what would it profit a man if he gained the entire world, but if he lost his family? What would it profit a man to gain everything, worldly wealth, recognition, fame, fortune, but to lose his family along the way? And this morning, I am convinced more than anything, and the reason I asked Steve to share is because I believe that the best chance for a successful family, to have a successful marriage, to raise successful kids, I believe it starts with the role of the man, the man of the house. Now, I understand that this morning, we come from different backgrounds, and there are some that are, have, their families have been broken, and I want to say right from the beginning that God still has a plan. Last week, we talked about uh, GPS, the, the, that if you get off course and you've got one of those GPSs in your car, if you turn or you take a detour, it's automatically saying, recalculate, recalculate, recalculate. And God still has a great plan, no matter what has happened. But this morning, I'm talking to men this morning and to women, and uh, because uh, for those that are women here, I, I want you to start to desire a godly man in your life. Some of you have godly men, and you, you are blessed because of that. Others of you say, man, I wish my husband would be more or uh, would be different. And I would say we need to start praying that God would uh, direct us and lead us into that. I'm talking to singles. For those of you that are single men, I want to challenge you to be the man of God that God has called you to be. And for those of you that are single ladies, I want you to be praying that God would put a godly man in your life. And so we're talking to uh, teens and singles. We're talking to dads and sons and grandfathers, husbands, wives, and, and uh, even future mates. And I'm asking that the Holy Spirit would be the one that would be speaking this morning. Now, it wouldn't be my words, but it would be a Holy Spirit speaking through me, uh, right to you, that I'd be a conduit for what the Holy Spirit desires in your life. Amen? Amen. Well, last week we, I, I mentioned that talking about marriage at times can be tough. 
And we talked about marriage conflict, and oh yeah, it, it can be tough. And, and I, I, I felt very inadequate last week uh, coming into that uh, message. And, uh, and I even asked uh, my wife before, I said, okay, I want to talk about a little bit of this. And, and, uh, and it was kind of just making sure that what I would say would, would be honoring to her and to our relationship. And, and uh, for those of you that missed last week, you can listen online, and I'd encourage you to do that because there's a powerful message there. And, uh, but man, today, <laughs> to switch to the man's responsibility, I'm not sure which is harder. I, they're both tough topics, but I want you to know that as your pastor, I desire to be a man of God. And I want to be the best man that I can be. And it doesn't happen by accident. A few years back, when I was first in ministry, um, some of you guys know Jeff Grinnell. We were working together in Dayton, Ohio. And uh, I was doing, he was a youth pastor, I was a children's pastor. And uh, he he was introducing me to the youth group for, I was doing something, I don't even remember, But he introduced me at that moment. He uh, had a nice introduction, whatever. But one of the characteristics that he that he put uh, as a tagline on my name, he said, "And Pastor Ben is a man of God." And he's telling this to these students. I was like, "Whoa!" (laughs) At that moment, I had to think, "Okay, am I a man of God? I mean, is that even something that I could be called?" And then there was a part of me that really desired to be able to fulfill that thought that, yeah, that I am a man of God and I want to be a man of God. And uh, and there was this great desire. And I would say since that time, and I was reflecting, that was in 1998. And, uh, And so 10, 11 years later, I still desire to do that. But what I want us to know is that it's possible to be the man of God. Wives, it's possible for you to be married to a man of God. Teenagers, it's possible to grow up and to be. Singles, it's possible. But it's not easy. And it doesn't just happen by accident. Similar to the way that marriages have common struggle, there's a common struggle for, to be a man of God as well. And the root of that is sin. First of all, there's pressure, there's, there's conflict that comes with responsibility as a man. There's, well, I was talking with some guys this week asking about the different roles and saying, hey, what kind of roles are there uh, for, uh, for, for men? What kind of things are expected? Well, I mean, there's, there's a whole list, but you know, to be a provider, to be the protector, to be the leader, to be a lover. And these responsibilities, and, and uh, the list could go on, but these responsibilities for a man are hard work in themselves. It takes a lot of commitment, a lot of tenacity to be those things. But then you couple that with the idea that the enemy is real and that the enemy hates our guts and that he is tricky and he's the deceiver. And it can be subtle, like Steve mentioned in his testimony. It can be subtle. There's a slow fade. I think there's a new song on the radio, a newer song. And that what happens is sin creeps in. And all of a sudden, we're compromising. There's traps, there's temptation. And it's the same for each and every one of us. And overwhelming, it certainly can be at times. For some guys, that responsibility with the temptation, it gets to a point where there's fear and there's uncertainty. And uh, they'll see what, what the, uh, the media portrays on TV or on movies. And then there's confusion. Many times what what the world would would, uh, classify as manly is actually pretty clumsy or pretty weak. Men full of shame or dishonest, experiencing drugs and alcohol and, and certainly sexually charged. And what happens is that men, if we're not grounded in God's word, any of us can be confused and we can allow Satan to get a foothold. Many will be led to dabble with sin. And then at that point when we are dabbling with sin, where we first get in our feet wet, if you can remember the first time you tried cocaine, there's two options. One option is that we think, well, it's no problem and everyone's doing it. Or there's, you know, it's just common, I'm a man, it's no, that, that's what guys do. 
But then there's another uh, uh, avenue that's almost equally as bad, that we hide what we've done. And then there's shame, and there's, there's pain, and the fear of being exposed is, uh, is, is very real. And it, then you add that to the context of a family, and you say, well, it'll be okay, right? Well, I want you to know, guys, and women, men and women together, we can be sure that no one will make a fool out of God. When the Bible says you'll reap what you sow, there are consequences. Our sin will catch up with us. The sin is caught up with me at different times in, in our relationship. Have you ever felt busted before? Got exposed, got caught? It's painful, and destruction sets in. And maybe you've been there, or maybe you are there, or maybe you're headed there. And what happens is men try shortcuts to godliness. Instead of taking God at his word, and, and uh, certainly it comes from the very beginning of time. But the good news is, and I want you to know, guys and ladies alike, is that God does have a plan. He has a way. And his plan is not a shameful way. It's not a weak or fearful way. It's not dishonest. It's not spineless. When we mess up, God does not give up on us, Steve, and others. He pursues us relentlessly. He loves us more than we could ever imagine. I want to look at the role of a man. There's some scriptures that really talk uh, great about this. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5. We'll get there in just a second. Um, but before we do, there's two verses that as I was reading, I just uh, had to smile and I thought, well, I'm going to read these because they just bless me. Uh, for, while you're turning to Ephesians 5, uh, in Proverbs chapter 5, verse 18, it says, uh, may you rejoice in the wife of your youth. And someone just needed to hear that this morning, okay? Rejoice in the wife of your youth. And then in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse number 9, it says, enjoy life with your wife, whom you love all the days of your meaningless life that God has given you under the sun. Isn't that great? I just chuckled. I'm like, man, you know, and, and there's a challenge there that, that we need to be enjoying ourselves. And uh, there's something about uh, a healthy marriage that there's joy, there's rejoicing, uh, and we can enjoy as the, as, as the days go by and as things change, we change. Uh, but there's just a great joy. And uh, I just want to say I love you. And I love you too. God bless you. <laughs> and, uh, and so, so we wanted, I wanted to start there. But let's turn to Ephesians chapter 5 because right uh, here. Now, many times when you talk about the role of a man, we'll start maybe in verse number 25. But I want to start, back it up just a little bit and look at verse 21. Because from 21 through the rest of chapter 5 and into chapter 6, Really, that is the crux of, uh, of, a, of the role within a family, okay? We're talking about family matters. Verse 21, Ephesians 5, 21, uh, just screams family and that it matters. And it says this, it says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, I just want to stop there for a second. Because many times, we'll start in verse 22, which many of you know, it says, wives, submit to your husbands, right? And we'll say, the wife is supposed to submit, and then the husband's supposed to love, right? And we kind of, we'd say that. But man, whoever uh, organizes scripture and, and categorizes, I think they missed it on this one. Because you have to understand that the covering for all of what is said through 22, through the end of the chapter, and into chapter 6, talking about parents uh, raising kids, and even into uh, talking about slaves and masters, the covering there is that there would be an equal submission to one another out of reverence for Christ. And when you talk about submission, it's a coming under. It means um, uh, to, be, to be respectful of to consider someone else to submit. And so it says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Verse 22 says, wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. But today we're going to talk about what the husband's role. And, and listen, verse 23 it says, for the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body 
of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. But remember, it's an equal submission there. Okay? Verse 25, husbands, love your wives. Love your wives. Husbands, love your wives. You're the head of the home. Husbands, love your wives. For those boys that are here that are, will be men at some point, your responsibility as you will grow is to love your wife. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and he gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing of water through word and to present her to him, himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds and cares for it just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother to be united with his wife. The two will become one flesh. This is a profound or mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. Now, I want you just to stop there for a moment. And you say, well, if, if it said, you know, wives submit, think about what Christ had to do in the relationship of the Godhead to submit, to come under the plan that God had. He had to, what Christ did for the church, he submitted to the will of God. Uh, high submission there. And then, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. Verse 33, however, each one of you must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Verse, uh, chapter 6, uh, we'll skip to verse 4, another part of the role of a husband or the, of a father in the family. It says, fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and in the instruction of the Lord. We're talking this morning about submission and love for, for, uh, for, for men. When we define it, it's to surrender, to yield, to be under. And that has been God's plan from the very beginning, is that the husband would, would submit, the husband would be the leader, that we would love, we'd raise our kids, we'd train them well. And I want you to go with me to the very beginning, to the fall of man, Genesis chapter 2, verse in Genesis chapter 3. Last week we talked about when uh, God created uh, husband and wife, and, uh, and uh, man said, This is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She will be called woman, for she was taken from me. And for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, be united with his wife to become one flesh. And then verse 25 says, the, the man was, uh, and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. And in chapter 3, though, that sneaky devil, right from the beginning of time, gets a foothold. It says, now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal the Lord God had made. Now we're talking about the men here uh, this morning and the role of a man, and I want you to be mindful of that. But the, the serpent comes to the woman First, he says to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, well, we may eat of any tree in the garden, but God did say you must not eat the fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. And you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, I want you to stop there for a moment. And many times we think, well, boy, poor Eve being tempted by the devil there. Um, but what we're going to see here in just a second is that it wasn't just Eve in this story. All right? Let's continue. It says, when the woman saw that the fruit was, of the tree was good for, uh, for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some of it and ate it. Now listen, she also gave some to her husband, who was there with her, and he ate. Now I want you to see that at the same time that Eve is being tempted, the man was there, Adam was there, 
mindful, understanding what's happening. She eats, and then she shares it with him. Now, the reason I think so much that they were there at the same time that, that Adam saw her take that first bite, because at that moment, it says, then, at that moment, the eyes of both of them were opened. Simultaneous. The, their eyes were both open, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and the wife heard the sound of the Lord, the God who was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord among the trees in the garden. They hid. They were full of shame at that point. They knew they had made a huge mistake. But then in verse 9, we talk about God pursuing man. Listen to this. But the Lord God called to the man, to the man, the one that was to be the head of the home, and he said, where are you? Where are you? And I would want to submit to you this morning that from that moment to today, that God is still pursuing men, saying, where are you? Where are you? That's the very first question you'll find in Scripture. Addressed to the man and saying, where are you? Now, the struggle from that point, from that moment on, has been consistent. In 1 John chapter 2, verses uh, 15 through 17, we see John talking about this. He says, don't love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful men, the lust of the eyes, the boasting of what he has or does, comes not from the Father, but from the world. At that moment, sin entered the world, and from that point, I believe, until Christ returns, we will have a struggle with the world. The world and its desires will pass away, though, verse 17 says, but the man who does the will of God will live forever. Adam was caught at that moment. Eve was caught. And they tried to hide in the shadows. They were stuck. Their shame was, was uh, in full force. They were exposed. And then they were fearful. A little later in Genesis chapter 3, it says, Why are you hiding? And it says, He answered, I heard you in the garden, but I was afraid because I was naked, and so I hid. And what happened so many times is that when we stumble, when we fall, instead of coming to before the Lord and saying, God, forgive me, or be coming uh, before someone and saying, hey, I need some help, we hide and we, we, we find ourselves full of shame. But this morning, men and women alike, I want you to know, Romans 8 talks about that there is nothing that will separate us from the love of God. And that God is still pursuing and God desires men to be the leaders of their homes. Romans 3.11 talks about that there's none that will seek after God by themselves. No one just wakes up and says, hey, I'm going to go after God. Because John 15.16 says that God is the one that has chosen us first. 1 John 4.19, he first loved us. And he's pursuing after us. And I just want to say that there's absolutely nothing that you have done or could have done that would make God love you any less. There's nothing in this world that would separate you from God's love. There's a story about a son that got caught in an act of sin. He had taken a ball, a small little ping pong ball, <laughs> tight ball, and he brought it home, and it ended up in the receptacle at, the, at home. You know, we all have those bowls where things, miscellaneous things end up. And the mom and dad were like, hey, where'd this come from? And uh, they're like, well, <laughs> uh, the boy's like, well, that's the craziest thing. Where did that come from? Who knows? And they just kind of dismissed it. it was a, the ball was, had no value. Well, a couple days later, the boy gets in trouble. Him and his brother are fighting. And that same sort of uh, attitude uh, comes on the boy saying, 
boy, it's the strangest thing. I don't know how I hit him. <laughs> and, uh, and the mom's like, hmm, you know, we know that there was a fight. We know that, that, that uh, Johnny's crying. And the mom said, you don't know how you hit your brother just like you don't know where the ball came from that's in the little bowl. And at that moment, the boy ran upstairs and found himself in his parents' room, hiding underneath the covers in his parents' bed. Now what happened was in this story is that the boy stayed there until dad got home. And the dad knew what was happening and uh, came home and, and the mom said, hey, you know, Billy's upstairs. Uh, I haven't heard a peep. It's been a couple hours. So the dad goes upstairs and the boy in all of his shame and all of his fear is hiding underneath these blankets, dripping sweat. The father looks in the, in his, the boy's room and there's no one in his brother's room, looks in the bathroom. And the dad finds out that, man, the boy is in his father's bed. He knew the right place to go to, to dad's bed. But he's under there and he's covered up and he doesn't know what to do, dripping sweat. And at that moment, the boy had a choice. As the dad pulled back the covers and saw his son just sitting there and dripping sweat, he had the choice, the boy did, to either deny what happened, say, ah, it's no problem, no big deal. Or he had the choice to, to, to continue to live in that fear and, the, and to cover himself back up. But the boy, like any young boy would do, in the hands of his father, he kind of curled up next to his dad and said, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And what was so neat is that this story, the father just says, there's nothing that you could do that would make me love you any less. And that's a human father. I could see myself with my son doing something similar to that. My son one time <laughs> stole a little uh, uh, Bakagon, little character guy. And I remember saying, Logan, you've you got to take that back. You know, it didn't. But I didn't love my son any less because of that. And guys... And ladies, you may be here today just heaped in your sin and, and, and no one even knows. You may be underneath that cover full of shame, just dripping sweat, sweating, sweating life. But the choice is ours. And men, if you don't think that uh, your sin affects your family, think again. Families are affected. And it's our choice. We can either choose to live in the sin that we find ourselves in. And what happens is we'll end up passing that sin the Bible talks about from generation to generation. It's very possible. Up to four generations the Bible talks about. But I want you to know that there's another choice to turn from our sin and to ask God to help us in the process. And men and women alike, when we turn to God, there is a blessing that comes a blessing of that will go to a thousand generations, the Bible talks about. And I want you to know this morning that all of us, that God is pursuing us this morning. He's saying, just like he was looking for Adam and Eve, he's saying, where are you? As we talk to the men, I'm saying, where are you? You are to be the head of your home. You are the leader, whether you like it or not. You are to be the man, to be present, to be active, to be engaged. Maybe you've forgotten about your wife and forgotten to submit, forgotten to love, forgotten to remember. Maybe you've lost your kids in the process and you're, you're broken and destruction has set in. I still believe that you are the best chance for success in a healthy family. The men are the best chance now, does God work things out when there's other problems and a man is not present? Absolutely. But I believe that God's best design is for the man to lead, to
to lead fearlessly, to be the man. You may be young, you may be single. Someday, you are going to be the lead in your family. And you must be determined right now. No more shadow. No more living in the, in the darkness. And to bring that into the light. See, we cannot pass off our duty, guys. None of us. We can't continue to blaze forward saying, well, it's not going to affect our kids. It's not going to affect our wife. It won't affect the future, our actions. And I want you to know that on the flip side, that you can be a man of God. And you can have a successful family. And you can be God's man. When we talk about the fact that family matters, it matters to God. It's important. And when he pursues you in the relationship that you have in that family, there are responsibilities that come. Hard, sometimes yes. But is it possible? Oh, yeah. And God is calling us, calling me, calling us to be men of God that are full of courage, full of wisdom, full of the Spirit of God. Are we going to be perfect? No. We're, we'll stumble, we'll fall. But I know that as we pursue God, we will have successful, healthy families. This morning, I want to encourage every man here to do something. And you might say, man, I'm just a young man. <laughs> you know, I, I'm just a teenager, just barely a teenager. I see some. But this morning, I want to encourage you to make a covenant with yourself and with God. A vow, so to speak. To be the man of God that he wants you to be. I'm going to encourage you to write something down before the end of today in your Bible. If you don't have your copy of God's Word with you, I'm going to encourage you to do it when you get home. Some of you have it here, and I'm going to encourage you to do it before you leave. I want you to flip open to one of the blank pages, and sometimes you'll write notes for different things. Um, I want you to write in your Bible something simple like this. It doesn't have to be word for word. But I want you to declare and put the date on it that today, November 8th, 2009, I choose to be a man of God. All right? And some of you guys are doing that right now. Others of you, you're going to have to do that later. But to write down, I choose to be a man of God. And then I want you to sign it. Put your signature there. Because I believe that as days go by, as temptation comes and temptations go, the common struggle that, that men face, that is going to be a place where you can turn to remember, to come back and to say, you know, I've committed my life to Jesus. I am a man of God. And then I want us to leave here today with our head held high, that we can make it, that we can do it. Because I know without a shadow of a doubt that God's heart for you personally is for you to succeed, to be strong, healthy, and for your family to succeed. And like I've said, I believe God's design, his best design, is that there would be a man in a home that would lead well with God's help. I want you to bow your heads to close your eyes this morning. The reality of what we're talking about is pretty deep, pretty challenging. And I realize that in a room like this, in a sanctuary, we all have come from different backgrounds, from different 
struggles. But this morning, I believe that God is pursuing us with tenacity. He's saying, where are you? Where are you? And this morning, we have a choice, all of us, to either turn towards God or to continue to hide, to be in the darkness. And I'm wondering this morning if there's anyone here that would say, man, I need to get my life right with the Lord. I just want you to slip up your hand. Men, women, who is it this morning that needs to respond? Yeah, sure, a couple, two, three, yeah. Saying, I need God to restore that relationship. Who wants to say yes to the Lord? Yeah, thanks, good. Amen. Amen. Who else this morning? There's nothing to be afraid of. Romans 8 talks about that there's nothing that separates us from his love. And the fact that Jesus continues to pursue us. And this morning, one, two, three, four, five individuals have raised their hand saying, I need to restore that relationship. Anyone else want to join them before we pray? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, John. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, for your touch. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord. Those that raise their hands, I know uh, who you guys are and you're, you're, you've been able to track many of your lives. And I know that you know how to pray a prayer asking for forgiveness. And in this moment, I'm going to encourage you to have the courage to just simply ask God to forgive you of your sins. And I believe that there's some here this morning when you consider where you are in your life, there may, be, there may be the need, like these five or six have raised their hand, that you need forgiveness as well today. And I'm going to encourage you in this moment to pray a simple prayer, asking God to wash away all of your sins. Hallelujah. I'm going to give you a moment to do that. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God, for your touch. Thank you, Lord, that you are healing our hearts, that you've saved us. Jesus, have your way in our lives, I pray. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. This morning, I believe the Holy Spirit is speaking to hearts, speaking to men this morning. And I believe that there are men here today that are struggling with sin. And I would just want you to know that the struggle is common. It, it shouldn't take any of us by surprise. The enemy, he's tricky, he's sneaky, he's, uh, he gets a foothold. But men, today is a day to draw the line in the sand and you can turn to Jesus. It's possible possible to live a godly life. I'm going to ask every man in the room to stand right now.
Men, you are to be the leaders of your family. Some of you are future leaders. And I know God is speaking to your hearts even now. I pray that there would be a desire so strong in your lives to be God-honoring that there would be nothing that would stand in the way of that. But men, it doesn't happen on accident. You don't just wake up one day and you're godly. (laughs) It takes commitment to God's word. And then it as we look around, just take a look around. We need each other. Just take a quick look around. None of us can do it on our own. What the enemy would love to do more than anything would be to isolate us. The enemy would love for you to walk out of here thinking, well, I'm the only one struggling with whatever you're struggling with. And I just pray that the Holy Spirit would give you incredible courage to face the thing that you're struggling with. The moment you confess your sin, the Bible says he's faithful and just to forgive you of that sin, to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. You say, well, why do I have to confess it? Why do I have to say it? Why do I have to share that with anybody? God knows, doesn't he? He does know. There's no question. But when you confess, when you share with someone that you can trust, the enemy flees, I'll just tell you. There is strength in that confession. There's accountability in that. And I just want to pray a blessing over the men today. And I'll tell you, I was talking with Pastor Mark before church, just asking for uh, some insight. He said something that was very, very profound. Pastor Mark's good for that. He said, you know, he was talking about his wife. He said, you know, Julie, she really wants me to be the head of the home. (laughs) She wants me to lead well. And he said, you know, sometimes uh, she'll lovingly... uh, encourage me that way, but never condemningly. And I just want to say to the women that are here, if you walk out of here and continue to love your, wife, or love your husbands and, and just encourage us, and, uh, and I know Jessica has, has done that as well in my life. She's been a great, great friend <laughs> and stuck by me through a whole lot. But we can make it. We can do it. Amen? Father, I pray a blessing over each man in the room today. I know you have great plans. And Lord, I know there are men that are missing today. Wives that are here alone, and and we pray for those men as well. We pray for future uh, men of God, teenagers that are here standing saying, boy, I want to lead well. I understand my responsibility to submit and to lead and to to love. God, I pray that you would just help us, that we would not do it alone, but Lord, together, we would have successful families. Because Lord, we understand that family matters to you. It's important. And God, no matter what the family situation is, no matter how great the struggle, no matter how great the problem, Lord, you can do miracles. And I pray right at this moment for miracles to be happening in our spirits. God, that you would give us this desire. And Lord, that we would commit, we would uh, write out a covenant with you even before the day would be over that we choose to be a man of God. Lord, we thank you for that. Go before us, behind us, and all around us. And God will give you all the praise and give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
God bless you guys. Yes. Please have a seat. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. I was about to dismiss you. Got something for you, Penny. <laughs> Ushers, why don't you come at this point? We want to bless you, give you a chance to, to be a blessing. Um, boy, talk about leading well uh, according to God's Word. God's Word says if you give, it will be given unto you. And I just want to encourage you to be faithful in that. A couple things as we uh, look. We want to encourage you to be bringing in pictures uh, for our Family Matters board, up to five per family. And uh, you don't have to bring that many, but we're going to do a drawing on the 13th of December and uh, give away a family prize pack for those that participate. And we'd love to see as many pictures. we got several that were added today. Come up and look at those after. Also, Pastor Mark wanted me to remind you, we're doing the Speed the Light pop can drive. And right uh, outside of the church, you can throw in your pop cans, bring them here, and uh, that all goes to Speed the Light. Um, today, right after church, there's a parent meeting for those uh, that have kids in elementary or junior high or high school. And uh, they'll be meeting right here, about a 10-minute meeting with Pastor Mark. And then the last thing is, uh, in just a couple weeks away, we've got a Catalyst Impact Night. Talking about family matters, we are encouraging those that are in the uh, uh, youth age, uh, ages uh, or grade uh, 6 through 12, and then your parents as well to join us uh, for our Catalyst Impact Night. We're calling it Family Secrets, and uh, we're going to join us for, for free pizza that night at 5, and then at 6 o'clock, going to have a service, and uh, we are praying that God will just meet us there. And one of the things that they're going to do that night, we're going to have a little contest, one of the games, and we need your help, parents, uh, is we need a picture of you as a baby, parents, all right, you as a baby, and a picture of your kids as a baby, and to turn those things in, get them to Pastor Mark, and uh, he'll be communicating how to do that exactly, but um, those are a couple of the things. There's also a ladies' women's night uh, coming up, a movie night, and what's the date on that, Jess? Um, the 20th of November, and so ladies, please uh, participate. We'll get that in the bulletin and the emails and all that uh, out as well. All right? Well, let's pray. Father, thank you for an opportunity to give back to you what you've given to us. And God, I pray that as men lead their families, they will lead the charge in giving as well, being faithful to your word. God, it, it, uh, it is so uh, important for us to be honoring your word in our lives. God, I pray that you will just continue to do a great work within each of us, and we'll give you all the praise and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. After you've given this morning, you can be dismissed. Amen? <laughs> So you better give. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> After the offering plate goes by. All right, there you go. Praise God.